Hello dear VFXers! Today I'm going to show a solution to optimize VATS for blood splash VFX. And here you have two examples. On the left we have a VAT and it looks nice and it's also a cool solution because you can visualize a pre-baked simulation real time. However, it has some issues and one of which is that it's expensive. And the more resolution you put into this, the more expensive it gets. And you can see here, in this example, we don't have a lot of resolution. We have maybe max 5k triangles. And then here, I have the same amount of triangles. But damn, we get quite a nice result. But what if I tell you that this is not using VATS at all? And actually, perhaps even more useful, because if I select the mesh, and if I were to rotate this randomly, you will see that these droplets are affected by gravity regardless of their orientation. And that's actually a problem with VATs. They are always directional, so you can't really rotate them. But also that it's expensive. To show you, let's go into material. And I mean, this looks quite clean and tidy, but once I go into this material function, you will be shocked what's inside. And don't get me wrong, this is an amazing solution. I don't disagree with it. But just look at how much stuff is going on in here. And I thought, yeah, maybe there's a way to optimize this. And what a lot of games do is, like Mortal Kombat, for example, many of us saw this amazing GDC talk. And I think they were limited to maybe use four fluids. And then they were also using some 2D sprites, which actually I uh, created like you can see here. But anyways, let's now have a look into this material instead. And you can see that's it. There is not much more going on. So that's crazy. And even crazier, let's go to the mesh and observe the triangles. The moment I start to zoom out, as the screen size decreases, you will see that this works with LODs. So that's another plus. And um, I will show you my breakdown. I'm going to show you this in Houdini and I will show you an example of a simulation. And later on, I will teach you a few more amazing things like creating the roadmaps for these 2D sprites and such. If you want to follow along, don't worry, I will show you everything. But for those who are more interested, my project files are available for download, so you can grab those. This also includes my Unreal project, but also a lot of Houdini files. So when I go to my Houdini folder, here you see there are a few examples with amazing stuff going on. But anyways, let's get started and dive into one of the Houdini projects. Okay, so let's dive into my Houdini project. Let's first start with the emitter. And like many other fluid tutorials, we start off uh, from a sphere. And then we add a mountain stop. And then we play with these uh, noise pattern values. So we say in the offset, take the current frame, divide with a given duration, and then also add an offset, which uh, allows you to quickly create a few variations without having to change too many other parameters. And then we create our normals. And then what I do uh, after that is I blend the shape back to its initial uh, form. So here we had the shape and then I rescale this one and I fix the normals. Although actually we will take the normals from this one and override it and then I use this blend shape node and then here you see which ones uh, we don't want to transfer so the normals and then it looks like this but although you can also do it with a, a point wrangle just like this up plug this in and then all we want to say is that uh, at p is equal to point from the second input we say we want to, no, sorry, we want to uh, override the normals, I'm sorry. And then we want to say, okay, we want to override the normals. And then take pt num. Because we have the same uh, point count. So like you can see here, uh, this also works. Anyways, let's move on. 
Then from here, we uh, create the points from volume. And those are going to be the particles we spawn our uh, fluid points from. But of course, we want to transfer the normals because we want to use those as velocities. And so we take these uh, velocities from our mesh and then transfer uh, the point normal to this uh, to these points basically and then we use this as our emitter and then here we can see our normals so yeah that's it for the emitter but then we want to source a continuous uh, continuous velocities to burst out these particles because it can happen that these velocities suddenly uh, slow down too fast because of drag or just they, they keep sticking too much to their source and so um, I'm basically sourcing a VDB velocities so let's start here first I take the current position and I flatten out its x-axis and then I save it as another attribute and then uh, I sample a noise and I say okay this is going to be my strength value it's a float and then instead of p I use the flat p Although you could also use P, but uh, I don't think it necessarily makes a big, big difference, but it's just about fine-tuning these parameters and just seeing what, okay, brings me better results. And so this worked for me. And then I take, uh, like you've seen before, the current frame divided by a duration, and then I add an offset. And then let's move on. Here we play with our velocities, so I add a directional velocity, and uh, this is going to be my velocity, and then I also add to that um, our normals multiplied by a strength, so this one. And then, of course, I uh, expose these parameters by clicking here. Then from here, we uh, create uh, VDBs from our particles. And then we want to uh, s uh, basically transfer our velocity attribute and store it as normal vel. And additionally, you can now start playing with your um, VDBs. So here I smoothen them. And then here as last, uh, I also play a bit with the, the density, but uh, in the end, I ended up not using those. I just say normal vels multiplied by one basically means I'm not making any changes here. And this is going to be our sourcing velocity. Okay, let's move on to creating our simulation. So let's move out of here and then let's go to the dot network. And here you see my simulation. So let's bring it here. And what I do, I created a flip solver. And then first I created my emitter and I linked it to my odd emitter. And I source these points for the first three frames. And here, this initialization, uh, basically this doesn't mean anything. It, it sets standard parameters, but like you can see here, I'm not sourcing any volumes and I'm also not uh, creating any fields. And then the only thing I do is sourcing the particles because I want to source the velocities from my um, VDBs, basically. And so, yeah, here you can see I sourced the velocities and I linked the activation parameter. So I said copy parameter and then pasted it over. And, and then here you can see the, the normal velocity is being sourced and I set it to my velocity. And then I also set the scale. Uh, other than that, uh, I also say source these because else the data is not going to be available. And then moving on, we want to, of course, also create our fluid object. So here I set the particle separation. This is the same value set on my points from volume, by the way. And uh, there's not much going on other than some just some basic tweakings. So let me just show you. This is a guide, so nothing important. Uh, the initial uh, uh, data, nothing really going on here. And then let's uh, go to the flip solver here. Um, first of all, I set the time scale to half the speed because I found that the, it allowed me to get more uh, quality out of my sub steps. And then here I set the sub steps to six and eight. Um, 
volume motion, particle motion. Let's see. Yeah, what's important here is uh, I detect my uh, droplets. Um, just some basic stuff going on here. I age them. I have my ID attributes. And then in the volume motion, I set it to swirly. I found that this was uh, creating better results for me. And then here I also enable surface tension. But uh, I keep the, val uh, the value low in the beginning because if this value is too high from the start, then basically your fluid sim won't have any chance to destroy. So basically these droplets won't have any opportunity to, to, to separate from each other. And um, when activating the surface tension, everything will kind of start to shrink which creates a nice effect. It creates kind of this waterish effect, but uh, I enable it later on in my sim, basically. And then uh, divergence, well, basically I don't have any, so I think you can discard this one as well. And yeah, here, this is not much. And then here, um, I was sourcing some uh, collisions, but we don't need those for this simulation, so we can bypass this. And then all I'm doing here is I, I also create gravity. And uh, I keep that value fairly low. And that's it. So now we can uh, sim this one out, like you can see here. Voila. And now we can start meshing out our sim. So let's go to the uh, second part, the fluid remesh. Okay, so first I import my simulation with this DOP import fields. And then uh, I say here, import my DOP network. And then I also define the fluid object. And then I import the geometry, surface, and velocity fields. And then here I added a read time. I did this initially when I was creating these VATs to kind of play with the motion of the simulation to burst out particles fast and then. Uh, slow down the speed. So here I have set uh, a Bezier and I can actually also show you here. It is the animation editor and here you see me uh, play with the scale. And uh, then here I create two groups. The first sphere you see me animating it. And then the second one is just a static sphere. And then here within the first group, the group that's called keep. I keep those points. And then in the second group, those are points that I want to ignore. And I will explain you why. Because here in my wrangle now, I want to remove a few points that are too slow. But I don't want to remove points that have gone farther away from their uh, source. I only want to focus on the source, basically. So this is why I created these groups. And then I check, okay, if it's ignore, so this one, if it's one, so that means we, we can check here. And then uh, here we say, okay, if keep is zero, so that means here the, it's zero, so those will be affected, but those will not be affected. So only in the beginning, I don't want really to remove any, only a bit later on. And then I check as the final thing, I check, okay, if speed is below a given threshold, then remove my point. So now you see um, in the beginning, I do have a lot of points at the source, but then I start removing those. And actually I also play with the speed threshold value. So I'm animating it. And uh, now we can uh, start surfacing our fluid. Uh, not much going on other than that I set the particle separation to the same value of my uh, points from value, volume. And here in the droplet scale, I also decrease that value over time because this allows me to erode those droplets. And then within the filtering, um, I set the value here to 7.33, um, but I'm not animating it, but it just helped me to define the style of my uh, fluid surface. And then I output this as polygons. Then I clean a little bit. I remesh a little bit. And uh, here I smoothen out a little bit. 
to have less of these sharp edges. And then I fuse a few points because like you can see here, now selecting this node, we have less points, that's good. And then here I drop down this connectivity node and this allows me to create a class for each separate uh, droplet. So we can control click this one and then here make sure you're on, on the class. And then we set this to color and then random from attribute and then make sure that this one is enabled. And then here you can see the different classes. And then I uh, create a measure and then per piece from the class attribute. And then I output this as area and I uh, put this attribute on primitive level. So when I go to primitives, here you can see the, the uh, droplet size. And then uh, for all primitives, I check if they are below a given threshold and then I remove them because I have a few very, very, very small um, droplets that are basically invisible and then I remove them. And then simple, I do a poly reduce, I recalculate the normals and then I cache this out as the low poly mesh and then I also create an out node. And then for the high poly, I also cache it out and then say high res mesh. Now we can move on to preparing it for our uh, fake vet. Although this one is not as important. Actually, I was only using it for my vets, but let me just quickly dive into it. So let's go to this node and also disable the visualizer. And then here I import the high res and the low res mesh. And then I measure the convexity and concavity. So here you see the red and the green uh, colors. And then I transfer those over to my low res mesh. And then I also had this convert node um, because I think uh, if I remember properly the um, lapse vertex animation texture. So this one was complaining. And so I had to make sure that this one was converted to polygons like you can see here. And then I output it. Okay, but anyways, we don't need it, so we can disable it. And we can actually just go into our fake vet instead. And then here, so I first import the low res mesh, and then uh, I recalculate the normals. And then here I create my UVs. Um, although those are not correct UVs, uh, as you can see here, I'm just projecting them. But if you wanna do a better job, then you might wanna use the uh, auto seams and perhaps the, the pelt, although there's many, many other ways. I'm not going through this because actually I didn't really need those. Although now I'm also creating a second pair of UVs and it's because I want to store data into those. So perhaps as an optimization, what you can do is get rid of the first UVs and then just use the second UVs uh, for the data. But you'll see what we're gonna do with this and then you can make the change if you want to. So anyways, now here we um, put down the connectivity node to calculate the amount of droplets that we have. So we have 60, sorry, 61. And then uh, I promote the normals from vertex to points because I'm going to need those. And uh, then I also measure the droplet size and I promote it from primitive to points. And then here I make sure that this is clamped. And I set it to the vertex color alpha because we want to use this uh, for animation purposes in the material editor in Unreal Engine. And then here we do all the magic. So basically, let me just first show you. So uh, let's go to perspective viewport. And so what we want to do is for each droplet, so for each island we want to find what is the closest point to the source and then we want to store this into the vertex color for each droplet and we can then use this vector to push our uh, droplets into that direction but also to rotate that around that vector and use it as a pivot point basically and use it for many other purposes as well actually so anyways uh, this all happens in this attribute triangle here so first I create an array and eventually this is going to have the size of the amount of droplets that we have. So 61. And here this is called a list of closest points. 
and we call it LOC. And then we also have another float for the longest distance because we want to rescale the vector to 0, 1 ranges because vertex colors are limited to 0, 1 values. And therefore, we want to map them in and then map them out in the material editor. And then we are going to store this into the second UVs. That's why, uh, like I explained here, this is why we created those. So anyways, first we want to loop over all points and we do this on detail level. And then we want to grab the current point and then also the distance to the source by just taking a length of that position. And then we take the last longest distance and we max it with the current distance. And then this value is actually going to keep incrementing over time whenever the value was greater for the current point that we loop over. And then now we check if the array index already exists for the current droplet class. So for the current droplet from the point that we look on, like you can see here. And if that already exists, we also want to check if the uh, value of that uh, point, that class, is not set to zero. And if that is the case, then we can basically set our values. So uh, like you can see here, first we grab the current point and then we check if the distance uh, of that one is, the current one is smaller than that one from the array, then we can set the new value of that array to the position. So of course, this array is a vector array. So that's why we can set positions to it. And if this statement is false, so if we don't have any values, then we want to create the index, so the slot. And we are basically resizing the length of our array by adding in our new values on that index. And then I store the locator array as an attribute array, so we can preview it here, although we don't really need it, but we can have a look at it. So this is going to be the size of 61. And then I also store the longest distance as an attribute. Um, but like I said, you don't really need it. It's just for visualization purposes. And then again, we want to loop one more time over all our points. And then we check, OK, we grab the closest point from our array. And then we also grab the current point. And then here we set the vertex colors divided by the longest distance. So like I said, we remap those values. But of course, we want to bring them from minus one and one ranges back to zero and one. So we add by one and then divide by two. And then we set the UV, uh, the second UVs, to the value of our longest distance. So we can actually also preview this. So when I go to the UVs here, now, let me also put on the visualizer. So here you can see the value. And then I multiply the vertex color with this one in the material editor. Anyways, now the rest of it is not really important. This is just for visualization purposes. But uh, as you can see here, I added a strength parameter and I offset the position um, based on that vector. So now you can see how this simple motion would look like. Of course, this is not the final animation that we are gonna achieve in the in, in real engine, basically, but uh, it gives you a basic idea. And then as last, we also created these visualizations. So how I did this was I checked for the current point and uh, I checked if the current point the distance of it is the same as the distance from the array or close to. That means, okay, we're actually looking on the point uh, of which the value is also the same from, from within the array. Then we want to say set a group, a point group to the value of one. And why I do this is because now I can set visualizers to it. So here you can see group expression. Now I create a group from, from that attribute. So actually, this is not a group. This is actually an, 
uh, an integer basically yeah this is a uh, indeed just a, a point attribute so it's an integer so i create a group from it and now here you can see me visualize those points but then i can also use it to mask out these vectors so uh, when i go here and i uh, created an attribute from from the closest point so let me go back so that means here I grab the current value and then I set this style to vector trail and I mask it based on that group and I set it to this attribute and if I were not to use this group you would see um, basically all points are getting this vector trail and we don't really want that we want to visualize it only for that specific point so therefore I am doing this Voila, and then we can simply go about exporting this. And uh, now we are ready to look into Unreal. But before we do, I just want to show you my setup for the VATS exporting method. Okay, so let's go to the out here, to the out network. And here I added a Labs Vertex animation texture. And I didn't change a lot other than I didn't really like the, the naming for the exports and I changed those. So you can see here, I add my own prefixes like static mesh underscore, and then also uh, the suffix underscore vat. Although you can also define your own uh, suffixes, but you can't really define them manually. So I set this to none. And I do the same for the others. So the textures, and then also for the data table, and then what I do is the export part, I set it always relative to my pip name. So within the export folder, I create a subfolder and it's gonna be named bloodsplash08, just like my, uh, my hip file basically. And then it uses this in the export and it sets this folder and it keeps it all really tidy and clean. And this is why I prefer going with this method because now your files are more readable and you can also more easily recognize which one was which. Then other than that, there are not many other settings I changed. So let me just quickly go through all these tabs and that's it. Okay, let's now finally go to Unreal. But let's make a second part out of this video because it's going to be a little bit too long. So the second part will be a lot shorter as well. And then in the third part, we will also look into an extra method. So how to create these 2D blood sprites, which is also really an amazing solution. But anyways, before we move on, I want you to have a quick look into my most recent course. And actually, this is the first course I ever made. And honestly, I think this is really an amazing course. And this also goes very well together with the blood VFX that I'm teaching you right now. And yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed that <laughs> no one bought this course. So there was definitely some interest, but you know, maybe the price is a bit shocking at first. But I must be honest, I put really a lot of time, like months of work into this course to make sure that the content is clear, readable, understandable, and that, you know, we're really learning a few interesting lessons. And actually also, apart from all that, this is offering you an amazing solution that has never been discussed or shown before. And that's, you know, how do you create swoosh meshes with rapid animations where you like maybe only have two or three frames or maybe a bit more but you know you cannot really use other methods within Niagara and then this is offering you an amazing solution really I think so so just have a look into it and uh, yeah apart from that let's move on to the next chapter see you guys